Stay more comfortable, more concealed, and in the stand longer with Osseo gear. Premium camouflage apparel created for bow hunters by bow hunters. Osseo's revolutionary patented camo patterns and innovative features are designed to keep whitetail bow hunters totally invisible and dead quiet. Elevate your game with Osseo. Visit asiogear.com and take 20% off your purchase with code TRUTH20. Mobile hunters, our buddies over at Tethered are always innovating to keep us more mobile and in the game when it counts. From the Tethered One Sticks, the Fast Pack, to the Ultra Lock Saddle, Tethered is always designing to increase comfort and utility while reducing bulk, weight, and fiddle factor of mobile hunting gear. And now, they've outdone themselves yet again by creating the Carbon Fiber Forged Predator CFX Platform, the lightest fully featured mobile saddle platform that raises the bar for what's possible in mobile hunting gear. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old tree climbing veteran, go to tetherednation.com for all your saddle hunting gear. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And today I have on a fella that uh, I've been, t- man, I don't know how long it's been. I feel like we've been kind of chatting online for like the better part of two years, if I'm not yep. mistaken, just about that. Well, deer hunting, of course, but I've got on my buddy, Mr. Brandon Barlow. What's going on, man? Hey, hey, thanks, Glenn. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm you grateful. Bet, man. You're one of the uh, you're one of the few Southern guys that I've had on the on the show, dude. So you're you're bringing bringing the South. So you're, you got to represent. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to. My family would probably uh, hate you for saying that because they're all <laughs> the Adirondacks. But I know, right? I know. The uh, I I was actually born in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh wow! That's, yeah. So my dad was in the Navy, um, and was you know on a base in 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 the Carolinas. I don't know where all he like was on the ship at and stuff like that. Because we moved back from there whenever I was probably. I know one or two like so i was born there on the naval base and then shortly after my dad got out of the navy and then we moved back to pennsylvania so all i really ever knew was pennsylvania but funny thing is my birth certificate it's charleston south carolina nice know? nice yeah i don't try to own nice. any of the south you know it's like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do that you know don't want to piss off southerners and also don't want to piss yeah. off my yankee family but yeah yeah but you can still come down here to hunt that's all right dude and i should man like so my dad lived, so for the longest time, my dad actually lived in North Carolina for, for probably, goodness, probably close to 20 years, I think. Um, and That's I never made I'm it. Down. Yeah. You're in North Carolina? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What, what part? Center of the state. So if, uh, if you look at where I-95 is north and south through the state, and then you look at where 64 is east and west, Mm-hmm. Right where those crosshairs are, I live about uh, 15 miles from there. But uh, my county and the neighboring county have no public. And then the two counties that touch them, the public land gets pounded. So I have to travel mm-hmm. to like the Uhari. I've hunt a lot there, which is an hour mm-hmm. and a half. Um, so I, I've got to travel a little bit, but I'm dead center to the state, which puts me Really, I can be in Virginia in an hour in South Carolina, mm. so it's pretty dope. Nice, nice. That's sweet. Yeah. So I get a yeah. bunch of tags, you know, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not bad, man. Yeah, my dad was in. Uh, he was in around the Raleigh area, Raleigh Durham areas where he yeah, lived. Yeah, that's forty five minutes up the road. Yeah, yeah. And I never made it down. I always thought about going down in the summer because the season's open earlier, right? And I was like, I could go down and do a little summer visit. He's got a nice pool, lounge by the pool a little bit, do a little hunting, you know. Yeah. But I was always like. Man, it's so damn hot down there. I was like, I don't... it is. It <laughs> During is. deer season, I was like, it just doesn't. It just doesn't feel right, you know, for me at least. You know, for where I grew up and how I grew yeah. up hunting, like hunting in the heat like that. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I complain about it here in the middle of September whenever it's like you know eighty degrees. I'm like, man, this sucks. Like, why well, doesn't I want yeah. forty degree temperatures? Two years ago, not this past fall, but 2022, uh, I had a, a big eight pointer show up on twelve one. And I killed him on twelve three in in swim trunks. Like I literally, I took the. <laughs> it was the first buck I ever killed in shorts. But dude, it was eighty three, and I was like, I literally got to my truck because I always wear like my swim trunks and my t shirt. Um, I'm kind of a scent Nazi. I mean, I'm not full like you know, an Eberhardt Nazi, but I'm almost there. Right. So I don't wear my stuff in my vehicle and any any of that. But uh, I wear like my shorts. So I got there. And it was just one of those days where it was so hot. 
So uh, I was like going to hunt this one spot and I was like, you know what? I have this other spot where there's like a really good creek thermal and I could just rock shorts. Mm. <laughs> and, and that's exactly <laughs> what I did. I just sat there and right on the edge of the creek and yeah, I just, yeah, it was the first deer I killed in shorts ever. Nice. That's awesome, man. I don't know if yeah. I could do it. Like the, 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 the extent that I've gone to is like, I'll hunt in just like a short sleeve shirt. And then I've gotten into the tree before and been like, dude, this is too hot. I just took my shirt off. You know what I mean? And just, yeah. just, you know, I figured I'd let it eat a little bit while I was out there, you know, let the chest <laughs> out, like sun's out, guns out situation, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. I always, I always laugh because I walk into my stand a lot and I'm usually just in my, uh, in my base, my basest layer, which mm -hmm. can be my boxers and my mocks or like my rubber boots. <laughs> Usually, when in the, it's winter, I'll have like my long johns on, which mm -hmm. still look funny when you have the stuff around you. You look like a ballerina, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like everything around your waist, and you're just. But I've walked in in my drawers before, and like I've walked right past people's trail cameras, and I'm like, oh. Like somewhere, someone's got a picture of me in my underwear with all my right. gear. But, but it's like 90, you know what I mean? Like it's down right. here in the south, you cannot wear your stuff to your tree. Like, Dude, you you might be the Mike Honcho of uh, of, yeah. of bow hunting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we have to wear waders down here a lot because uh, uh, of just the terrain. And so I've been in my waders with like no shirt on. Like I know that right. sounds terrible, but like. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of interesting trail camera pictures out there with you and there, buddy. Yeah. I think that's what, the, that's what we're yeah. saying. Oh, I yeah. think you're just covering tracks. I think you're doing some oh, interesting yeah. shit on trail camera that you don't want people to know oh, yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have. I've walked past them barely dressed before. Right. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I've given up on the scent thing. Like I used to be pretty regimented about the scent <laughs> stuff. Um, and then I just kind of gave up on it. Uh, really because I was traveling a lot and there's just, there was no way for me to stay like clean and scent free. Like, you know, whenever I'm in Idaho hunting elk or if I'm in mm -hmm. kids hunting white tails and I don't have somewhere to wash my clothes and it's just, you know, I'm going to be stinky and I'm going to be dirty. Cause I'm not going to shower and like all that stuff. And so I just kind of gave up on it. Oddly enough, when I did and I stopped worrying about it, I've always been kind of a, like an, a little bit of an access Nazi, you know, um, accent entry. Excellent. And then when I stopped bothering with any scent control, my access got actually even better and I actually started having even more encounters. I think because it actually forced me to not cut any corners on my access. Cause I feel like I probably falsely thought I could cut a corner here or there because like, oh man, I'm, I'm super, you know, uh, conservative about my scent, you know? And so I can probably get away with this when the reality was I probably couldn't. And so now it's like, I know it's like, dude, I'll pump gas on my hunting boots. Like, like, I don't give a shit. Like I walk into like the, the corner store. We'll chat and I'll be in Kansas. We'll go get some lunch and it'll just smell like fried chicken. And you come yeah. out and you smell like fried chicken. You know what I mean? It's like, so I'm like, I yeah. gave up on that stuff. And so now it's just like, I'm just way, way more specific, you know, and more mindful of just like my entry and exit and what my wind is doing whenever I'm entering and exiting and you know, constantly checking it and stuff like that. But, you know, it's, there's definitely, there's definitely, you know, there's, there's situations where I have to be sent free down here. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, I know you want, we'll get into that, I guess, whenever you want to get into like set control, but uh, there's situations down here. I mean, it's flat land and it just swirls. It's a lot of just Creek bottoms and, mm -hmm. and marsh and, uh, I hunt a lot of bedding areas, so if I'm gonna go out really early, like three thirty or four in the morning, and get on a marsh island that I know they're bedding on, like where I killed a a ten pointer this past year, um, that's the only time where I'm really, really psychotic about making sure my boots came out of a tub in the shop. They they didn't see anything until I put them on. Um, uh, I'm really crazy about making sure my merino is clean and I'll wear scent lock in that situation and I'll carry two aiders and go two sticks higher and, you know, two aiders higher and I'll do all the, all the little things that you can do to play the odds. And it, cause when you're hunting a bedding area, everything can just co go wrong so easily mm -hmm. and quickly. Um, just by like the smell of a cheese sandwich can blow everything off an island. So, <laughs> like, so like I'll be yeah. really, really psycho about it in certain situations, but then other situations like killing the eight pointer with shorts on. I mean, if, 
I think, you know, wind mapping is <laughs> all mm-hmm. my spots are wind map like psychotically. So I know where I can fry bacon and kill a buck. Right. But yeah. I also know where I have to wear my scent lock. And if my, if I wore my scent lock three or four times and I was lazy, um, the does are going to bust me. So like I have right. both spots really where right. even when I'm perfectly clean, I get busted. I have those spots. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, you always love those spots. There's spots that are impossible to hunt too. You know? Yeah. You always love those spots where you're just kind of bulletproof. I forget who I was talking to about this, but <clears throat> where I shot my deer this year, um, it's one of those spots where it's just like <laughs> the, once the sun comes up, the thermals just basically, set you free for the day yeah like, you and you are bacon and kill a buck yeah <laughs> i mean i'm dropping milkweed and it's just shooting straight up in the air as long as i have yeah. a bluebird day you know what i mean as long as it's a bluebird day yeah. out like i'm i'm golden and i've i've cheated so many deer in that spot where i've just like i've had yeah. it like all around my tree downwind of me you know well you know in theory downwind of me yeah. um by the you know the by the wind direction you know not taking into account the thermals and just like beating them left and right and that was like I remember the first time I went in there, I was checking it and I was like, I don't know how this hunt's place is going to hunt. And whenever, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh man, I was like, this is like, if there's a good deer in this particular area, you could come in this spot and you could hunt it. It's one of those spots where you probably can't over hunt. Mm-hmm. If, even if you tried, because that, you that's come, the same as the spot where I killed that eight pointer. I have a completely clean access in there. Yep. Um, the way that the creek is, nothing's going to cross it. There's three or four like little three foot waterfalls, so the the water really picks up pace right there. Mm-hmm. And even back when I used to vape, it, that was one of my favorite spots because I could just sit there and blow clouds, and right. they would just go, they would go straight down the creek like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just love that spot. So that day when I was going to hunt a bedding area and I had all my scent lock and everything clean, and then I was like, it's 85, I'm going to just go to the vape spot where I can just wear shorts the and vape like, spot. see it's down like... the gas line, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, that's awesome. But I think for me, I have both types of spots. So right. um, the only way you really know, though, is to go in there and blow deer up, you know, or throw milkweed and try not to blow deer up, but... Yeah. I mean, that's what I always say, man. It's like, like spots that are new, like, you know, I always kind of use those, you know, and we're, kind of, and we'll, we'll just jump into stuff, man. Like I always kind of use new spots as, uh, as areas that I'm going to hunt on either bad weather days. When I say bad weather days, it's just like, not that it's like raining. Cause I, I do like to hunt some of my better spots when I have a little bit of rain and stuff, but on and on days where it's just like the, either the time's not right for that spot mm-hmm. or the time's right and the wind's wrong for the places I really should be during that particular time of year that I know that can produce right after, you yep. know, through my scouting and stuff. And so when I get those types of days, I'm like, man, you know what? I'm going to throw a hunt at this place that I scouted this past year. I hung a camera. Maybe there's a deer or two in there. Maybe there's not. Maybe I haven't even checked the camera yet. I just want to go check the camera. I'm just going to go hunt it because I don't know what the deer are going to do and I don't know what wind I need to hunt. And so I'm just going to go in and see what the wind's doing in that spot. And then at least I'll know for this particular wind in these conditions, this is how this place is going to kind of function. But it sounds like you also have some spots like me where you know when to hunt them. Yes. Yeah. You and I are a lot alike in that way where it's (laughs) where we play the long-term data game where it's like, we'll walk, you know, hang cameras, hunt spots and kind of understand them over the course of several years to where it's, you know, you know, I have spot, you know, and this is kind of like, I don't, I don't want to say how you and I became friends, but this is how you and I really started talking a lot was just off of that kind of long-term data about talking about having particular areas that we know that, man, there's a three to four day window. And like, if you miss it, that's it. But it's going to be three to four days of dynamite. If you can time it upright with getting the right wind to hunt it with the right right weather conditions, that spot's going to pop off for three days. And that's kind of how yes. you and I started talking was because you know we both have that similar approach of being very kind of strategic in that regard of like this spot gets hunted in this time frame. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, that's how I found your podcast. Um, I wasn't really online. We were talking before the show about I had a flip phone just a couple of years ago, but yeah. <laughs> um, I wasn't really online too much. And then uh, uh, various circumstances led me to get into saddle hunting, which uh, led me to John Eberhardt through YouTube. Um, I knew of John before, but 
never really like uh, watched any of his stuff, but he had a lot of stuff on the internet about saddles seven or eight <clears> years <throat> ago. And uh, there really wasn't a lot on YouTube. So I started watching his videos, decided to email him. The dude just calls me. Um, the guy's like somebody who I like at the time is like really idolizing, you know, and he just calls me out. blue. He's like, I got all these documents and PDFs. And he's like sending them to me. And so ever since we've corresponded on email, but um, I he, it led me to watching some podcasts. And well, he goes, man, there's a lot of podcasts out there because I was asking him some questions about breeding dates mm. and uh, if he tracks any kind of asterisk timing or anything like that. And he was like, uh, no, but John also has at the same time, he'll say no. But he also has like a Rolodex of like you hunt this thicket at this time. Yeah. And he has like a thicket that's like that's a Halloween thicket. So at the same right. time, he still is, yeah, he still is doing it. So, yeah. uh, it, but he was like, there's a lot of podcasts out there. I'm sure you can find some resources. And that led me to listening to some podcasts. The first podcast I ever listened to was yours. Hmm. And I listened to them all. I have to catch up. But, um, and then I, from there, I listened to a bunch of other podcasts, but really couldn't find anybody else who was talking about like, um, historical data or mm -hmm. breeding dates mm -hmm. or everybody else was more like terrain features and you hunt uh at this time or hot sign or you know the um kind of how you would hunt if you were just going in the woods blind but mm -hmm. nobody was really kind of in it for the long game like growing bucks on mock scrapes uh, mm -hmm. led me to you and then a few other people that were mock scrape guys but they just do it a little differently and uh, i guess to make a long story short um, ended up circling back to you, yeah, because nobody else really talks about like breeding dates. And I guess what I found through all of this was, um, I think everybody has a really unique approach to deer hunting, and mm -hmm. I think I, my approach is unique. And um, I don't think any right is anyway is right or wrong, but <laughs> for me, I had to hunt a lot of small parcels, so mm -hmm. uh, I just learned like I got. Uh, like five acres out behind my house and there's no bucks out there but even does like you're only going to shoot a doe out there like during like a time when the acorns are falling it is a ghost town otherwise mm -hmm. and so whether it's breeding dates or food a thicket or a small parcel is either hot or it's not and so right. um if you're just going to go hunt grandma's eight acres blindly I mean, that could be tragic. You're not going to see anything, most likely. I mean, right. unless you know apples are falling or unless you have some fawning dates and you know that that's like when you need to scrape pictures or something to tell you that you need to be there at a certain time, like like you're doing, um, to just hunt small parcels blindly, I think, can be very, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure you've done it. I know I have, where yeah. I'm going in the woods. I look back at it now and it's silly, but at the time I was going in the woods to kill a big one, you know, and yeah yeah 100 dude yeah. there's so many times this like looking shit. back on it where it's like i was going in going like dude i didn't have a prayer you know what i mean like yeah. looking back yeah. on some of them but you know for me that <laughs> that long-term data stuff really for me was started by hunting a lot with with chad from exodus because you know i met him shortly after they started exodus you know and and so you know as he kind of continued to evolve you know not just the company but also his approach to things, you know, in using trail cameras and like looking at the data differently. And, and it's not just a picture, but there's a lot of information you can gather from it aside from just like the, the photo, you know, and the photo is just one thing. That's just confirmation of life. But like, there's so much more that you can infer, not just from what the, not just from like the data bar that's on it, like the time, the weather, like all that stuff. Like you can start to like pick up things by, especially with video mode, like the behavior of deer and things like that, that you can really start to kind of build an understanding of an area. And so he was using long-term data and it was in the big woods. And it was, and at first it was more around like travel data and like weather and stuff like that. And, and for me, it's like, I have some, I don't want to say bigger parcels. I mean, I hunt some smaller public parcels, but for me, it was so much is variable in deer hunting. And, and we, and we know that, right? Like food changes throughout the year. And some years it doesn't just change throughout the year from like season to season as food sources shift, but it also like one year might have food the next year. It may not depending on like the acorn drop or whatever the case is. 
And, but the one thing that I was, when I had a conversation with, um, the dudes from MSU deer lab, that was one. And then another one was with Don Higgins. Don may not be a biologist, but I would challenge anyone to find a person who like has watched and studied deer more than Don has in their life, you know, and just like, and, and just it, understands and knows, you know, from watching the him. only person, another one like that, like, I guess like Don would be the only person I've met who's really been able to, I have, I didn't meet, I should take that back. I, I'm, but was really able to have a really intelligent conversation about surrounding fawning and breeding mm -hmm. dates and understanding like that the rut doesn't all happen at once. Yeah. Um, is, uh, Mark Drury, I, I oh, yeah. only communicated through him th on Instagram, never on a phone call or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but because of some of my posts, I guess it captured, it's captured a few people's attention. And so right. I had a couple conversations um, and that guy, I guess, like you were saying about Don, like, I think, I think there's a very small select group of people like that that have been tracking that for a long time. Yeah. I think it's only now, like it took someone like me finally went to public school you know and took me a long time to come out with it but <laughs> uh, right you know right. but i think a lot of these guys have probably been doing it for 30 years you know and it's oh just, man yeah for sure you know. and, and that's where it, it kind of clicked for me in in i don't have a lot of time you know working guy like everybody else and i was like well what's some of the stuff that's not variable well breeding dates for specific does really isn't variable. Yeah, they have the same breeding date. Now diff breeding happens at different times, right? Cause there's a couple cycles of it. Right. And not every doe has the same exact breeding date, but it all kind of clusters around certain dates, but you also have some early ones. You also have some late ones. And so it was that, and then understanding like more just like doe family dynamic behavior and knowing that they passed mm -hmm. once I learned and this Don told me this, like once he said it on a podcast I did with him, he was like, you know, and I never knew this and it, that doe does pass their estrus date onto their doe fawns. And then as soon as I heard, learned that I was like, bam, I was like, that's, I, I found that it's less than a week. It's pretty close. It's not it's pretty exact. close. Yeah. And yeah. so the, uh, once I kind of learned that, then I was like, man, doe families stay together. So if they bed in an area, they're going to bed there unless something changes to move them, you know what I mean? And so if they want to stay there, that spot is going to be, if I find a spot that click kicks off at a certain time of year, it's going to kick off around that same time of year every year if that spot is a like is, if that spot is associated with doe bedding, because that yeah, doe family even, is going to hold that spot. And even when I find that I've ran over a hundred cameras for a long time now, and what I have found is, and I that I keep them on the same deer year round, so I'm not mm -hmm. like getting data from a whole bunch of different deer. I mean, I've got like nine years on this one doe, and she was at least five or six when I found her. So, wow. um, uh, but. Uh, what what I found was even when the does chase their fawns off, um, the they don't go far. So you can mm. end up with like a single estrus, like let's say an estrus, let's call an estrus date one week, right? Um, or give or take, we'll say give or take a week. You could mm. have that could be like that could be five acres, or I found that could be five miles. Like mm. it could be, you know, they she keeps pushing her does off and pushing her does off and. Um, and then there's like a reverse hierarchy because the oldest doe ends up getting chased off herself. What I find is like the most dominant doe is like six or seven. Mm -hmm. So then like one of the younger ones will take over and the old one gets pushed out. And, mm -hmm. and that's all based around like a primary food. Like if you have soybeans is where I see it. Like right. uh, the head bitch in charge is usually around <laughs> six or seven. Um, right. The 10, 11 year olds, they just pass their prime and they, yeah, they'll get their asses kicked if they hang out. But, right, uh, right. And then that just ends up like it just spreads out and ends up being like an ink blot of right. Astro States. Right. But I have two thickets that are on opposite sides of the highway and um, I've witnessed breeding there a month apart and hmm. they're, they're on the opposite sides of the street. So, that's crazy. It doesn't always have to be a giant ink blob either. I think it can be like it probably you know, has a lot to do with uh, uh, like I'm guessing. Like I'm just thinking out loud here. It's like I would imagine it has a lot to do with deer density. Would be my guess. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Here in the south, we have a high deer density, so I think it tends to keep doe groups tight. Yeah, where um, because we have such a high deer density that it's 
Um, I mean, it's just they're, they're all challenged for resources, right? It's like they, yeah. there's only but so much to go around. Territories are a lot smaller here, yeah. yeah. Like, um, I grow these little micro food plots, and I, I can hold a doe on, like, an acre because as long as you don't, like, go out there and scare her, mm -hmm. um, if there's year-round food, like, if there's, like, clover that runs into brassicas that run into, you know, then it's spring green up, you don't feed them anything, but then you turn around and maybe have a summer food source for them, like soybeans, she'll stay right there. Um, mm -hmm. In the fall... Uh, that deer will leave because the acorns are dropping up the street. Uh, there's no oaks on this piece. So sh this sh it'll be a ghost town during October. But um, as soon as the acorn season passes, those deer come back for brassicas. So it's like a, they just follow the food up and down the street, it seems like, you know. Right, right. So, yeah, it's interesting because, like, I've seen the same, the opposite of that, like, where I've seen that ink blot, right? So, like, the place that I kind of have areas that are, um, very kind of precise, I guess, if you will, it's in areas that there is limited, uh, limited land to support deer. Like just, you know, it's like the, and it's public cause it's a lot of like houses that are kind of on top of each other. And like, there's some public it's intermingled. And so that public is smaller and the deer numbers there are pretty high. So not a lot, not a great buck to doe ratio. So like when you're hunting that, you know, bow hunting that, in the whole area, all the cameras that I run, like I might get two, maybe if I'm lucky, like that are shooters, you know, like last year I didn't have a single one locally, you know, aside from the one that I killed that I was really kind of interested in, you know what I mean? Like there was, and I had never seen him before until I shot him. Um, and, uh, so, so with that, it's like, there's not a lot to go around. So I find like my areas are really kind of tight and turn on, like around certain dates, right? And it's consistent. It is, yeah. Transition. The same thing. Yeah, yeah. Transition to like the big woods piece that I hunt. And it's like a shit show. Like <laughs> for lack of a better way to put it, you know, like I can dial in on certain like general areas, but like not like I can around here where I'm like, boom, this area, this little two acres within this entire public piece is going to be the spot, you know? Yep. This, like the, the big woods piece is, is just not as easy to nail down. Like even like scrapes that are really good, like what we would kind of call primary scrapes just don't get hit nearly as often or as consistent. Like there'll be days yeah. in between, you know, maybe even like a week will go by that that same doe group or the same bachelor group of bucks or whatever might come through and hit it where locally, because it's tighter, it's like, man, once they start hitting that thing, it's like, I know it's going to be like every other day, like every two yeah, days, I find every that, two days. I minimum. find that with food. Like if, mm -hmm. so here the Carolinas, it's herbaceous and green year round. I mean, they're pretty much. So mm -hmm. if, if a doe here, you know, decides like her two doe fawns grow up and she pushes them out, they're just going next door to the neighbor's house. I mean, she's got mm -hmm. plants too. She's got apple trees too. They don't have to go very far. Right. Um, and so, but like in the big woods, like sometimes I think like the next great food source, yeah, that could be a ways. Cause I see mm -hmm. that in the Uahari cause it's all river bottom. And while it is all herbaceous, um, if there is a, like a food source, a hot food source, like white oaks, and then mm -hmm. maybe a half a mile away, there's like a heavy, heavy persimmons drop. Mm -hmm. then that will that makes my his, like trying to gather historical data really difficult because food migrations cause inconsistency and randomness mm -hmm. and i think then deer to some level are making decisions and it doesn't make for very good historical data i mean we can um uh i know you wanted to talk about that at some point but i think yeah, let's let's get let's get into that because like that's Cause that's the, I think that's the challenge that I have in some of the big wood stuff is that, is that I, I still have some areas that I feel like are consistent, um, producers to a degree, but I will say that I do start to kind of like lean back on in the, in the big woods kind of areas more so on like transition of food annually. Right. Like, so like the different time of year, what's going to be like, what, what's hot in an area and probably even more so like the terrain. I do have to start to kind of fall back on that because those are the things that are 
that are consistent from from year to year because they're just in this particular piece not like what you have in the south this place really dries up like once acorn drop happens and then like there's just not a ton of food and, I've talked- and you have terrain deer follow terrain if you have it yeah. i mean we don't have terrain in a lot of places and so it might just be an inside edge where like pines butt up against hardwoods that's what they'll consider they'll run that edge but it's not like a ridge or a Right. No, we have some terrain, but not like in Pennsylvania, where I think you can just hunt terrain, not even worry about food or breeding and kill a buck. Like I've done that in the Adirondacks, mm-hmm. where you just sit at the base of a beaver dam and sit there six times and right. smack a buck. Yeah. It's, at, some, at some point, something's got to walk through. You know what I mean? If it's yeah. a good little hot spot that's in between. Especially like... during the rut, because the rut's not like this, like it is here. The rut's like this, mm-hmm. and it all happens like in November and up like in the Adirondacks, it's a very tight rut, and the yeah. bucks go crazy, and you just see them chasing like in Walmart parking lot. It's not like that. Here. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do that here. Like it's a wide rut. I showed you some pictures. Like yeah, I still today have bucks holding horns. Um, That's crazy. And I believe that they only do that because they have testosterone because they're still does to be. You know, it's a really really mm-hmm. crazy wide rut here. Right. Um, and uh, yeah. When's it? When's it kind of kick off for you? Like when do you start to see? So, yep. The earliest I've ever seen a doe bred was in September. Um, wow. I saw a doe get bred the end of September on the island where I've killed uh, three three good bucks and a small buck at that island all in September. This year I killed a um, uh, uh, ten point. Over here, I killed a ten point um, out there on that island. He he was a good buck. He was he missed one fifty by a broken tine, so he was one forty three. And I shot him on nine twenty five on that same island where hmm. uh, I watched the doe get bred. The, so when I first found this public island, um, I ran cameras for the first year out there, and I realized that it was a September and October island. By November, the leaves fell off, and you could like see you across could it. Shine a flashlight right straight through the island. It's like a ten-acre right. island. It's not huge, right. so you can shine a flashlight right straight through the island um, when the leaves came off, for the most part. So, um, I I thought that that was why the island was kind of a September October island, and then the next year, I sat out there in September um, and I watched a doe get mounted, and I was hmm. like. And, and I, I couldn't believe it, you know, and that was what really opened my eyes to how early it can be here. And uh, I talked to a, a gentleman who um, he is in upstate New York and he has some captive deer. And uh, and he told me he was like, yeah, dude, he's like, don't listen to the shit you read in magazines. He was like, for one, as soon as that velvet, he goes, the velvet doesn't even have to be off. He says, if you just see that shit nicked a little bit. They're ready to breed. And he <laughs> said, they're ready. As soon as you see like one little bit of velvet coming off, they've got testosterone. And uh, he said he sees them breeding with like half velvet. And then he's even, uh, the times where they've done like late induced estrus for like breeding purposes, mm-hmm. um, like in February and March, he said that those bucks will hold their horns all through that period. Um hmm. And so when I started talking, well, after I talked to him and then I started hmm. putting puzzle pieces together, I started realizing, like, I think that the breeding dates are pretty wide and maybe not in the Adirondacks. Sure. I'll, I'll agree that it's a finite window there because winters are so harsh. But right down here, I've had fawns born. Uh, the earliest fawn, I have a picture on my Instagram. The earliest fawn I have was born April 6th. Hmm. Um, a doe walked by, she was hugely pregnant. She like staggered past and then she came back past and she looked less pregnant. And then like four days later, she had a little fawn with her. Hmm. Uh, just one though. I, I don't know why just one, she had one fawn with her and that was April. And then this past year I posted some pictures of a doe who, uh, in August, I think it was August 16th or something. I'd have to look, but she had like 10 pound spotted fawns. Wow. So based on, you know, basic math of a couple of hundred days, it's not a f- right. exact science, but if you take your shoes off and just do the basic math, I mean, that's September to February, you know, that's right. 
the wow. April fawn was probably she was pregnant by October to have an April fawn. Mm-hmm. And then the other doe was not knocked up until February to have an August fawn. So wow. that alone will tell you like, so um, I think when I was up north trying to find does that estrist early, it was like trying to find a unicorn because <laughs> all the rutting really happens in a tight window up there. Yeah, But down here, um, I think like, for the most part, so a November bred doe is probably going to have fawns like what? Like, I don't have a calendar, but like June to maybe 4th of July. Yeah, like June is Tuesday, I think, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> 6 15 to the 4th of July, somewhere in there. That's like a mm-hmm. November rut. And that was pretty typical for upstate New York. We Our fawns would drop mid June to mid July. Um, but down here, uh, November, when I first moved here and I started hunting in November, it sucked. Like I tried, I would sit in like, you know, and whatever terrain feature I could find. And I was just like, Oh man, this is, I found a ridge system. Like, you know, I'm going to right between two bluffs or whatever. I'm really, if I put 10 days here, man, I'm really going to get one, you know? And like, I wouldn't, <laughs> I would see bears cause we have so many bears. Right. And like that's all I would see. And, uh, and it was just like, why does the hunting suck so bad? But now I realize because I think, like 30% of our deer are bred before November. Hmm. And I think like 30% of our deer aren't even bred until after Christmas. Wow. So then when you start talking like that, like, yeah, November does kind of suck. Like it's not. Yeah. You're kind of in, it's not it's the like point in of between. The sphere like it is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's yeah. Cause like the earliest does I've seen, at least around me locally is that one is actually where I killed that deer this year. And October. yeah. Cause I know that, I backdated it because uh, I I was suspicious that the reason that why I was seeing the activity I was seeing in this area is because I had assumed that there was an early doe in that area. And so I was just, and I had cameras in there. I just had never seen an early fawn drop in there until like, I guess it was like two years ago. I finally got one on camera that was like, I mean, it was, you know, wobbly legged old, you know? And, um, and then I just did like what you were saying. I just did the math and backdated it like 200 days, give or take a couple of yeah. days. You know what I mean? And then from You're there, like, I was like, that chick was pregnant before Halloween. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where it was like, she was bred the week between the 15th and yeah. the 20th. You know what I mean? See, it was that like, is a unicorn up there. I would imagine mm-hmm. when you find oh, yeah. an early doe, For sure, like man. that's, you don't want to shoot her. Like that's a no, gift. That's no, keep I, on giving. <laughs> yeah. I will. I will not. Well, that the yeah. nice thing is, is like going back to what we were talking about with the, um, with the fawn estrus dates, right? It's like, as long as you keep that, doe family around there like that area yeah. is going to be pretty similar like year over year because it it's right adjacent to a doe bedding area and then adjacent to that is some years it's better than others when it's on fire there's a couple oak tree white oaks that aren't far away like a grove of white oaks and like the the year that the year that i kind of figured everything out it didn't kill anything that year but i had seen a couple good bucks in there when i was hunting just didn't get a shot when I went and did like my postseason scouting, I finally found like where that Oak flat was like, cause it didn't show up like on a map. It wasn't real obvious. Cause it's kind of like a swampy area. So there's not a ton of like Oak trees in this area in general. It usually stays a little bit too wet, but I found like a high place that had some Oaks and it was just like on being on roller skates. Like they couldn't eat them all. Like there were so many, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, bingo. I was like, that's why that doe bedding is here. That and it's just so thick too. They've got so much brows in there that mm-hmm. even if they don't have like the white oaks dropping, like they've got plenty of yeah. brows. Um, but I was like, when those when those white oaks are produced, and I was like, this place is just on fire. And so now every year, I just go into that area and check to see if those oaks are holding. And if they are, then I know that like pff, that spot's going to just be bananas. Yeah. You know, and this the, year wasn't this of, year didn't I, drop, and I still killed a deer there. So it doesn't mean that you can't. It just means right. that like when that spot is dropping, it's like it's a buck parade starting like the 15th on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, that's the way. So I, I, at one point, you know, through putting all of this together, hunting in the South and trying to identify, uh, my asterisk date. Then I, so about 10, 11 years ago, I waged full on war on asterisk dates. I decided that since I was at such a mercy of it that I had to try to figure it out because I was hunting pieces that were like, I was either hunting over pregnant does, which I know we've all done that where you Mm -hmm. like, you see a doe and it's November and 
she has her spike horn with her again and you're like why the hell does she have her buck back with her and it's mm-hmm. like is she pregnant is that why like because that buck shouldn't be with her like so yeah. i was like hunting in november seeing like does that had like they rejoined with their yearling that they just chased off so then i'm like well frick i think i'm hunting pregnant does and like so I really started to wage war on estrostates then, and that was when I it's really like trying started to pick up chicks at a maternity ward. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I, that's one thing I have learned is um, if you see a doe that reaccepts her yearling, um, I've found usually she's pregnant. Bad you know? news. Because I find like she'll take her spike horn back like after like three or four weeks after she's bred. So if I go looking at a doe and she's got a spike horn with her, I just leave her because I'm like, she's pretty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like cakes in the oven. You know what I mean? Like- <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ain't nothing good happening there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. there's a lot of body language. I think if for listeners, I would tell them that I rely heavily on body language because you can't just go by like, uh, and I did a post recently where I did a side by side of the same doe rub urinating in a scrape and the first one her tail was curled like this while she was rub urinating mm-hmm. and it was because she was nervous and at the end of the clip on a buck walks in mm-hmm. and it was a little buck and she's ter- she just doesn't like him there mm-hmm. and then in the next clip i have the same doe uh, like a month and a half later rub urinating and, her, and she's tail cupping mm-hmm. and the point of the post was body language because tail cupping is a sign that they're horny and they're they want to party so it was the same doe doing the same body language but just the subtlety of her tail tells you like you know um it wasn't 10 1 but like 10 23 she was tail cupping and and if you see a doe tail cupping and rub urinating yeah you want to like all of a sudden develop a cough and leave work because Right, she's gonna be bred <laughs> within twenty four hours. Like, yeah, and, yeah. And the bucks, they know that man. Like, um. So what I started to do was, I started running my cameras year round, and uh, I guess I, how that would translate today for a listener would be if you still had your cameras out, like mine are out, are out and I'm about to start maintenance. Uh, maintenance for one, my public land gates open for turkey season. I can get back mm-hmm. in there, but. Um, I do leave my cameras out and a lot of them are still functioning and what I'll be looking for on those cameras when I go back to do a maintenance on them, like my SD cameras I primarily use, is gigant- initially I'm looking for gigantic early does, like gigantic showing does because the does that w- what I find is um, it's a little unorthodox and people probably haven't heard it, but what I find is if I can find a doe who's hugely pregnant first, she's, she was bred first. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I have a little saying like early, do- early showing doe is early bow. So if you mm-hmm. can find a giant, pre- the first giant pregnant doe you see, you need to bow hunt there. Like, mm. like because, <laughs> that's the first the first visual you're gonna get on the estrus states is a giant right. pregnant belly. Some does are gonna be like, oh, I'm probably pregnant or maybe I'm pregnant, and then other does are gonna look like me and they're gonna be like, holy shit, she's pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need to bow hunt on the big pregnant ones that you're seeing first? Those does also give you a little warning because now that you've seen she's giant and pregnant, you can take other resources like other cameras and kind of move them in on her mm-hmm. and like find some broadleaf food below the knee that you know a fawn is going to like. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'll, I'll run cameras on, on broadleaf food if I can find like green briar below the knee. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can't reach very high. So if it's above the belt buckle, I don't even bother. But if I can find like uh, Greenbrier on the ground next to some grass or something thick where I think she'll fall and I'll move some resources in on that giant pregnant doe and try to get a more exact date of when she drops her fawn. But if you still have cameras out, at the very least, leave them for a couple more weeks and try to just see if one of your does is huge. And if, right. if all you do is bow hunt there, you're further ahead than than a lot of people are. Yeah, a lot of guys just bow hunting any random place. Yeah, so because how much... I'll take that pregnant doe. You know, I'll hunt her over a food source any day. 
Right. If I can so, find her in October. Yeah. So it's like, it's funny. Cause it's like the more we, the more we chat, it's like the more we are, I, I feel like we're similar in, in a lot of ways where yeah. like a lot of people, when they put their cameras out, they're focused on finding the, the bucks. Now for around here for early yeah. season, like for sure, because like to your point earlier, like we don't have that wide of a, a breeding window. And so, you know, that time frame to get something done around breeding is going to be pretty compact. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm still looking for those doe families and things like that and try to wrote. And it takes me a couple years to figure out and like, and then I'll rotate through doe bedding, you know, beginning like middle of October, you know, it's like, I'll kind of know, okay, I have these six or seven doe bedding areas. They turn on each of them turn on at like slightly different time, you know, monitor activity and kind of go in and set up whenever the, you know, the things get right, uh, right for that. And then I have areas where it's like, I'm clearly just looking to see, you know, in, in areas where I think that I have bucks kind of pinpointed where they want to bed and where they want to spend time, you know? And so I have cameras that are kind of dedicated to, to those areas as well. Now I will say not as many of them. I do kind of focus on, on scrapes for the most part, but how much of your strategy is reliant on percentage wise is reliant on understanding the does versus understanding slash finding the bucks. I'm going to say it's it's probably – I want to give you a real accurate and I answer. Ask, and I ask this because what I want to go yeah. into next is is I know you like to hunt specific bucks. You know what I mean? I, I do, that's and that's why I want to give you an honest answer because while I do give so much pre precedent to doe hunting and I know – I actually know – I track like 300 does very closely and I know when probably I think half would be an exaggeration, but I know when over a hundred are, are estrusing based on either seeing them be mounted or seeing the fawns be born mm -hmm. or like various, like, you know, um, having killed like a mature buck on that scrape, like three years in a row. I mean, if, if a mature buck passes your camera, on Halloween, three years in a row. I mean that right. you don't need to see her get mounted. You know why he's there. Like right. <laughs> he's right. not the there math. for the acorns. Yeah, he's not there for the acorns. I don't care what people say. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. happy eating like shit. Bucks are happy eating shit. Like they will come out like early season to to beans and stuff. But like when the when the pre rut starts, they're fine eating acorns and they're fine eating brush and briars and they, they're not really looking to have soybeans anymore and so with that being said i would say 70 30 because yeah while the majority of my focus is on tracking does and trying to document the ester states and getting general familiarity with the total range of the doe group and how they move from thicket to thicket and how the bucks prioritize those doe and, and i i actually have a lot of data i would like to share with you at some point with respect to like what i've been seeing and documenting with like bachelor grouping mm -hmm. and, and the only reason i bring that up is um i don't want to digress but i killed a mature doe um last year and it caused or two years ago and i believe it caused the bachelor group to break up hmm. um and so because they were bachelored there with her in the same field and so um uh, just some interesting findings like that, but 30% uh, of my time is on a specific buck, and the 30% of the time that's on specific buck is when I'm actually hunting. I mean, hmm. I would say in tree represents less than a percent of my hunting mm -hmm. because I'm in the woods so much without a weapon that um, for me, I also... Uh, I don't, I don't sit on a buck unless I know I'm going to have an encounter with a buck. So while I know that, so and I'm trying to think of how to articulate that, but like, I know that I've lost a lot of opportunities on a lot of big deer because I had a buck show up and I didn't, I didn't rush out there and hunt him, or maybe I didn't even hunt him the next year. I tend to like to have at least two seasons, but I prefer three seasons of history with an animal. So, hmm. so that's how it goes back to the 70% because I'm out there 70% of the year, um, you know, running scrapes. I run f f 40, I think 46 now scrapes 
uh, hmm. mock scrapes. I'm out running mock scrapes and thickets. And these are daytime deer scrapes. You know, if I'm getting nighttime pictures, I'll kill the scrape and move it. I mean, I'm, these are daytime bedding scrapes. And I'm getting daytime pictures only. And I've got 40 some out of those. And those are my dough, like my, you know, my doe scrapes where I'm trying to build estrus states, but I'm also documenting those buck sightings. Um, hmm. Those scrapes, most of the time, are where I'm hunting a specific buck. So let's say, like this year, I have, we were talking before the show, and I've shared it on Instagram, but I'm hunting five five year olds this year for the first time in a very long time. And so um, I'm hunting those five five year olds on three different scrapes. Um, the, the wide and the tall eight were both four this year. I didn't even hunt that scrape because I didn't trust myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a true yeah, story. I kept telling guys, I was like, well, I don't trust my, cause so I just stayed out of there cause these two brothers keep showing up and this year they're going to be five and they show up at the same time every year. This, well, the one guy showed up a day late this year and the other guy showed up six days late, which was mm -hmm. a little late for him. It made me nervous, but um, but they come back every year at the same time. So, uh, I'm hunting them on the same scrape. And then I've got, uh, uh, another buck I call old man Earl. Uh, and there's just an insane, he was probably 170 last year. I found him a 10 point on that same scrape with Earl, but last year was the first year there. So I just, I ran cameras to collect data and just get some dates. Um, so for me, if I'm hunting, if, if I'm in the woods with a weapon, it's because like with Earl, I've got at least two seasons or three on him, like the two four year olds out back, the, or, mm -hmm. uh, out back of, uh, uh, so where Earl and the 10 point are is, I don't want to give too much information, yeah, 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 but it's, yeah, on the, it's, on the north, it's on the northwest side of the Uahari. And I'm happy saying that because it's such a, a vast area. Um, mm -hmm. Then if there's a highway and there's a farmhouse where I got 80 acres of door knock mm -hmm. and out back of there, it's it's private. So I don't mind saying it's it, in out back of this lady's house. I have 80 acres and then I have another 46 that are near the public land and that's where Earl and and the big 10 point are so it's all kind of in the same area but uh basically um I'll spend 70% of my time running scrapes running does trying to collect data in that I'll pick up or grow some big bucks I I sometimes just grow them by accident it wasn't something I planned to do where I'm sure you've done it where like last year spike horns a 6 point Mm. And then next year he comes back and you're like, well, damn, he's a little eight now. You know, like that happens all the time yep. where a deer just is in an area and he grows up until somebody kills him. So, um, like the two, the two four year olds, the tall and the wide eight, I accidentally grew them from spike corn. So, um, this will be the fourth year now with those deer for me watching them. And I feel very confident that if I hunt, um, w the same week in October for the one buck, and if I hunt the same week in October for the second buck, they're both about two weeks apart. I feel very confident that I'm going to have an encounter because I did the seventy percent. Like I figured everything mm -hmm. else out, and I know they've been there three years in a row at the same. I mean, the one guy was six days late this year, but like I know he's coming. Mm -hmm. And what why I do you think? Why do you think he? Why do you think he was late? I don't know. It made me nervous. And uh, I, remember, I, I actually we, remember when this happened because we were texting back and forth or messaging each other on Instagram back and forth around yeah. the same time. You had sent me some pictures and you had told me about them and you were like, and when you finally got a picture, you're like, he finally showed back up. He's like six, you, you know, he said, he, you said he was late and that you were a little nervous that, you know, you weren't sure what happened to him, but yeah, actually I had another deer that was six days late. This one might've been like nine. You're right. But, uh, but he was late and I don't know why he was late. Um, and I find, so I think what I have found is that as bucks get older, their range shrinks. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I'm in their core range. I know I'm not in their core range because unlike Earl, where I got him at 8 a.m., 11 a.m., 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and only during the day, and he was there for two weeks in October solid. Um, these bucks do not do that. They are like a pass through pre rut 
transient bucks. So they're, they're my bucks. I grew there and I can bank on them coming back, but they don't live there. I don't get like, uh, the pictures you see, like shooting hours. The one day was 613. He showed up at 607. Right. Uh, the other buck, um, same deal, like shooting hours. I think the when one time was 650 and he was there at like 630. So they, they show up right at dark. And, uh, um, but I think that that's not their core area. So they're sweeping through there in the pre rut to like take census, to see who's around, um, mm -hmm. do their usual scent check thing. But I think as their ranges are shrinking, maybe, maybe he's going to mm -hmm. not come. So I'm a little nervous. That's what, cause I've seen more bucks where you get them a couple times on camera and then they're, cause I watch deer, like I said, I don't, I don't really hunt a buck almost never on the first year I find them. Um, right. It's always the second or the third year. So I see a lot of times where they don't come back or they do and they just act different. So for me, um, I feel like I've seen a lot of times that there is a line where you're like, okay, I got this buck this year. And then next year comes and you're like, oh man, he came in the same week. <laughs> He's done next year. And then the third year comes, but you got to work. Right. And you're like, you know, like, oh, I can't believe it. Like, I can't be there. Like, kids graduation or something, you know, and then uh, <laughs> whatever it is, and you miss it. And then the fourth year, he doesn't come. And you never know, like, did he get killed? Or Because around here, I would know. Right. And so it's like, uh, it's like, well, I didn't hear he didn't get killed. I mean, and this is a small area. I don't even hear if, like, someone hit him with a car, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. and I think, like, as you see their they get older and older and they shrink and shrink their area. Like their frequency becomes less and less until they stop coming. Right. I've, I've seen that happen. So I, I worry that the one buck that was six days late is already displaying that behavior where he's taking a day longer to leave his, his area. He wants right. to get back a day earlier. He's feeling less like, you know, He's just getting, he's just, he's turning into an old man where he's like, I like my creature comforts. I, you know, I, I'm not leaving my yeah. little, my little domicile if I don't have to, you know, now what about the no. big one? What about the one, 170? Like, what's your plan for him? Like how, how is he killable? He, so he's not on that scrape. That's the problem is he was a night buck. And while I normally ignore night bucks, well, you can't you ignore can't, one like that. <laughs> you can't ignore a 170, right? Not in yeah. the Carolinas. They don't come very often. So, uh, that deer is, I only have three pictures of him and they're in true big buck fashion. They're so mysterious with cameras. Um, but, uh, I have three pictures of him. The earliest was 1130 PM midnight on the nose. And then like 1 AM. And those were my three pictures of him on Earl's scrape. So, mm. uh, one of two things there, I'm going to double, double approach him. Uh, one, I'll be there on Earl's dates in October ahead of Earl um, to, to to kill him this year with my bow. Um, I like to, to take those dates and try to get out in front of deer. I always say, like, if you're hunting hot sign, you're a day behind. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're hunting hot sign, they're already there. I mean, these breeding activities happen like a flash fire. And so, you know, you can't just go run out and hunt a buck rub. You got to hunt a buck. So... Uh, my plan is to be on Earl before Earl's there and to kill him. I'm hoping that'll free up his area for that other buck to move in in daylight. That's one thing that could happen. Sometimes if you remove a buck, it becomes open turf, you know? Right. Um, but if that doesn't happen midnight, I mean, I'm looking at probably door knocking. Um, either he's coming. I, I The problem is where he's if he's coming out of the Uhari, I've got four cameras on that side of the highway on the four major deer trails that cross the highway, like, like 50 feet in the woods. I have a camera, mm -hmm. uh, just because I want to know what's crossing the highway. And so he, he wasn't on any of those cameras. So I don't think he's coming out of the Uhari, which means midnight, he's probably coming a mile. I'm gonna have to knock on doors, you know, and try to, Maybe right. go a half a mile up the road, start knocking, try to pick him up on a camera. I don't like playing that game. I think I know a lot of the famous guys on TV, like um, 
like the what's those those cats they they door knocked and took one of my pieces uh where i killed the hulk uh damn Who's the door knock guys? Uh, seek one. Seek one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Seek one. They took one of my pieces years ago. They did <laughs> came down. They, they sweet talked a lady. Yeah. She's like, you can't lie here anymore. And then I seen them boys, their truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was before they were big and famous though. But uh, right. uh, those guys, uh, you know, I know that's what they're all about. They'll find a big deer and they'll go and they'll skip ten houses, knock on a door, skip ten houses, knock on a door, and they'll just try to run a camera every mile up and down that mm-hmm. highway and get him. They'll get him on one of the cameras and they'll start to do what I do with scrapes, yeah. right? They'll, but for me, that game is like, that's not the game for me. I don't like knocking on doors like that. And I don't like chasing a deer in real time. So I'll probably mm-hmm. do some door knocking and try to get some more cameras out on that deer. But sadly, he's a night buck, man. You know, it's... <laughs> I, I just can't chase night bucks. Yeah, man, those night bucks will drive you crazy too, man. Because there's, there's, I have there's... a different folder that I keep them in. Let's put it that way. They don't even go in my main folder on my laptop because yeah, the only re- the only way I kind of keep them is if I also have daylight pictures of that buck. Well, I mean, I keep them, but like the only time I really ever reference them as or use them as a reference point is when I have that deer in daylight also, and I'm like, okay, yes. he's here in daylight, he's here at night, what time? however many pictures I have of him and across however many cameras I have of him, you know, and then yeah. you can start to kind of, yeah. you can start to then start to map out like somewhat how he's traveling, especially if you start to get him on the same date. And that's like one of the things there's a, there's a good deer. Or if um, you have the land to do it, like, yeah, that too. this deer showed up on 80 acres in the middle of the night. And like, that's tough. Cause that's a small yeah. parcel. Yeah. Like, what are you yeah. going to do? You, know, you can't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, uh, what I'm up against with this with this one is, uh, you know, he shows up at a specific time of year. Um, I have more daylight pictures than I do of him at night. You know, so that's so that's good. Actually, I don't even know if I have any night pictures. I know I do have two night, but they're just like just after dark. Like if if he was five yeah. minutes earlier or ten minutes earlier, like it would have been daylight. It would have been he would have been shootable. You know. Um, and I have him on one, two, three, three. I have him on three, three cam, three different cameras in a general kind of area, and it's driving me. It's driving me a little nuts because I don't know. Like I want to know where he's at, like for the whole season. And right now, I really only know where he's at for part of it. Now, the good news is, is it's part of the season where he's not really being. Like he's not running, you know, and this is like the interesting thing. Like, remember we were, we were talking earlier about what data can you take from cameras, like long-term data, like beyond just what the little data, yeah. What the little data stripe says, especially if you're running on video mode, there's a lot of behavior stuff. And so this is one thing I didn't even notice this whenever I was looking at the picture, but a, a friend of mine did. Um, and, um, my, my buddy Todd actually recognized, uh, recognized this and he mentioned this to me because I had sent him a couple like photos was just like, cause I, he knew I was going out to pull some cameras and scouting. He messaged me. He's like, Hey, how, how things go? Cause he knows this particular area. Like I, t- I typically have some like good deer that are running around. So he was just curious what I found or whatever. And so I sent him up a couple pictures and, and he was like, wow. He's like, that's a great deer. Like it's a hell of a buck. Yeah, and, that's um, a monster. Yeah. And, uh, he, uh, and the one thing he noticed and I never noticed was he was like, do you, do you know where he's spending time? And I was like, well, during this one portion of the year, you know, um, I, I know where he's at. Um, and he is like, huh? He's like, do you think he's close? And I was like, I was like, my gut's telling me just by looking at him, like he's an older deer. He's got the ass of a steer. So he's clearly like five and a half or older, you know what I mean? Um, I'm like, you know, I don't think he's far away. Like during the other parts of the season, I was like, because he's older, I was like, and what I've seen was a lot of those deer up there is like, as they get older, like you were saying, their, their area shrinks. Now they will like the one deer I was following into this year, like two years prior, like a deer I knew for three years, like he got killed almost five miles away from where I found him, but he also got killed at like the very end of the rut. So like he's making excursions. So these deer will make excursions up there that go really far. But like what I found is like, if I can find them in the summer or in the winter, Usually I can find them like in the fall because they don't transition real far until like rut hits. And then that's when they go. They don't do the normal like 
October dispersion, right? Like when they peel their velvet or like mid September dispersion for us, like where it's like they peel velvet and then they transition. Like we don't, I don't see that as much in the big woods piece. And, and then he made this comment to me and I was like, wow. I was like, I didn't really ever think of that because it's the time of the year that I got the photo. And he was like, man, he's like, he looks like he's in real good shape for that time of year. Like, he's like, what that says to me is like, he's not moving a lot. You know, he's like, cause he doesn't look like he's run down. He's got plenty of weight on. He doesn't look like he's thin. He looks still like yeah. a big size, big body deer. He was like, he's like, I don't think that deer is moving far from where he's laying his head. You know, well, and the I was like, Damn. Is, is, is how many times these bucks paths cross, uh, I, so where I live, you know, I don't think every county has a 150. I mean, we really right. have it. I guess it's a good time to talk about like hunting pressure. Anything that I say about like scent and I don't, I'm very careful when I build my mock scrapes and stuff with human scent. I, this is a super pressure area in, in South Carolina and North Carolina, both you, they get rifle season that opens 815 and it runs mm-hmm. through February and they can kill five bucks with their rifle starting in, in August. Um, and then also right here in North Carolina, they run massive packs of hounds after deer. Right. And so, um, I know, I know guys in Michigan and stuff, they deal with the like, like high pressure hunting in the Orange Army, but, um, uh, a rifle season that opens in August and you get five tags and then you add dogs, it's like, it's, it's a like the wild west pressure yeah it yeah, is yeah. and uh because when the dogs come through your piece because you can't even keep them off your private right they're allowed to right. just run so when they come let's say you own the 80 acres i hunt when they come through there um i'll have like earl every day every day every day and every day and somebody let their dogs go and the dogs will come through there i won't even see a fox for two weeks right. and then like i'll start seeing some foxes and maybe a bear and then the deer will come back but like those hounds, you know, man, they just, you send like 30, 30, 40 hounds through 80 acres of deer and there's nothing left in the woods. Mm-hmm. Like they've either killed it or they've, they've chased it off. So, uh, you know, we deal with that down here. But one thing I was going to say that really, really was eye opening to me was how much precedent early estrus does get. And that was one thing that really opened my eyes because, uh, hunting, uh, in, an agricultural area down here, which I, I do, uh, to some extent, uh, did more so when I started. Now I have the Uhari and I've got like white deer and all kinds of shit in there. It's like a jungle, mm-hmm. but, um, but before I was door knocking and far and hunting, offering like predator hunting to deer hunt, like killing coyotes to right, kill deer right. sort of thing. Like, um, uh, uh, we never really got into what I do. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer now, but I used to be a licensed electrician. So I made mm. connections that way. And I, uh, uh, was able to, to handshake my way into hunting some farms. And one thing that was really eye opening to me was when you're hunting, like where you have ag and small, like small connecting woodlots, like hedgerows and Creek bottoms and everything. Like, for example, the county that I live in where I used to hunt, it sucks here, but I used to try to hunt here a lot. If you look at it on Google earth, it's all open fields and it just has veins running through it. And those Mm. veins are like creeks and like hedgerows, but it's all open. Right. And one thing I learned hunting that and tracking historical data in that environment was I would get bucks on different cameras all around, but one thing I would see is when I found an early estrus doe, like the doe that, that gets bred in September that I saw, I would have those bucks that I had on those cameras hit her scrape, not at the same time, but I would see they would pass. It might be in the middle of the night, but I would see a buck where I have daytime pictures of him like Earl fricking five miles. <laughs> he would hit a scrape where that early doe was and he would just come through one time maybe stop at the scrape or just just walk right through it like just step like Mm -hmm. just walk right through it smell it once and then i don't know if he never comes back or if Mm -hmm. it was just a but those deer know where they are because when you're Mm -hmm. in that environment you've got bucks and all these satellite locations and it's like he had to cross like three highways (laughs) to check on that doe scrape i know man in that it, environment, I saw that repeatedly. Yeah, and it's, those deer know where those early does are. They do. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, especially when it's an old doe. That's another mm-hmm. thing. I don't think anybody really talks about doe age, mm-hmm. but the older does get the most priority. Like I find that a lot. Like I feel I always say like I feel like there's quantity of breeding and then there's quality. Quality. Of mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think yeah. like you're talking like ink blots earlier, and I think like let's say you have a, a mature buck. And you have a whole bunch of little ink blots, which represent different estrus dates. But you got these two big primary estrus dates, you know, one here and one two miles away. He's going to primarily want those two big, you know, there's more partying to be had there. There's more breeding to be had there. He's going to focus right. where there's more females. To some extent, if if one area has an old doe, I find that the bucks prefer that. And what I have found is... Um, a lot of times if the doe is like over six, like eight or nine, um, she just goes to the buck. Like he doesn't even have to come out of his hidey hole. Like, um, I I took pictures of it last year. I had a doe. She took her fawns out to the field, out to the bean field. And then she turned around and came back. I watched where she went into. And the next day I went in there and I jumped that buck. Uh, I actually jumped him right in his bed and she was with him. Um, and now, and then that was another valid uh, verification of what she did which was she took her fawns to ag and she went to the buck so there's right quality over quantity i mean if he doesn't have to chase mm. and he knows where there's an old doe and he can just go down there and stay in his little bed she'll come to him um that's yeah. what i see a lot of times yeah and i mean so why I would you why would you move if you don't have to right like they start they playing the game a lot of value in finding like a 10 year old doe yeah like if they don't have like the the, the older they get the, the 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 they play the game in a smarter way right like that just, just goes to him i find yeah, yeah. which is weird because you don't really hear a lot of people talking about that i've done a lot of research as you know like I've listened to thousands of podcasts and like, I don't hear anybody talk about like the doe going to the buck too much. And right. Well, I mean, that's how I killed um, my deer in Kansas this year. I, like, I, I, I follow, I followed the doe. Like I, yeah. I, mean, I saw him, but I paid attention to what she was doing. And she, was and she, she basically, you know what? I don't know. Like I didn't see her for it's very like long. Dope. Like I saw her in the binos from like almost a mile away. And then, you know, I saw her for, whatever it was, the 30 seconds I was trying not to get winded, you know what I mean? While she was seven yards from me until like that buck that, got close enough to shoot. That's the double-edged you know? sword. Yeah. That's yeah. the double-edged sword of an old doe is like, they get all the precedence, but they're also like, Oh, they're cagey. They're, yeah. They wow. will screw you super quick. But, uh, yeah. And they also will like walk right. Like when I go down there to like run a camera or something, like the oldest doe will like almost walk right to my truck. Like <laughs> she can stomp and stomp <laughs> they are, at me. They almost know like, like whenever when they when they're like uh, in danger or not, and they'll just when they know they're not, they just kind of taunt you. You know, it's yeah. like she's so, ballsy. Like I've seen yeah. her chase coyotes and like yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh, I, she's uh, tough, yeah. man. Yeah, but they dude, reach an age, I think. I want, yeah, I want to ask you about because we've talked about a lot of different stuff here today, um, and I know I've kept you here for you know about an hour and fifteen oh, minutes, fine. and I want to be sensitive to your time, but uh, you. I want to give you a. Uh, I want to give you a chance to talk just a little bit about what you have going on with Whitetail 101 because a lot of stuff we talked about today, like you put out really, you know, really great content for people who, you know, are, you know, what you call it Whitetail 101 because it's giving people like a very kind of easy way to digest some like maybe more complicated things, you know, that you'll hear people talk about on podcasts and they might talk for an hour about a thermal hub or whatever, where a new hunter What's or someone who's just... Yeah. And someone who's just kind of learning some of this stuff, it's like you do a really good way of kind of just giving them some really easy visuals to understand at the base level. Like, and you can make this stuff as complicated as you want to, but like there's some fundamental things that you need to kind of understand about some of these ideas. And you do a really good job with white toe one one of kind of breaking things down. So where did kind of like the idea for white toe one one come from and you know, what do you hope that it does? Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So um, for me, I guess, it was an evolution and it's still probably happening. I think Whitetail 101 will end up just being a playlist on a greater channel one day. You know, it's just an education portal that I wanted to create. I hope to turn it into like a, uh, uh, an E, like an E class. Um, I don't ever want to charge for any of it. Uh, I know, and I'm nothing against the guys who are great, you know, mm-hmm. capital, you know, I'm, I'm all about capitalism, but I, I don't ever really want to charge for, teaching people woodsmanship which is what it is um i 
I take a lot of I take a lot of pride in being an efficient deer hunter. I don't kill two mm-hmm. hundreds. I never have. I I kill like these little you know like one thirties and whatever. And and I shot a buck this year that was ninety five inches, and I lost fifty followers overnight. Like <laughs> if I get excited about a buck with my trad bow, I'll smoke them. I don't care. And so I'm not out for that. And um, I I think, but what I do take a lot of pride in is I am an, I am an efficient hunter. I I tend to, I I have a lot of tags and I fill them every year generally. Um, This year I was able, I was very fortunate. I harvested nine deer and I did it in what I consider 13 sits because (laughs) um, there were two sits. I did observation that I count with no weapon, Mm -hmm. but um, I spend a lot of time trying to run scrapes, run cameras. I gathered my data like with the four-year-olds (laughs) <laughs> this year when i sit there i i know i'm expecting those deer and so i take a lot of pride in being i guess efficient over over anything else and the only way that i've ever been able to really accomplish that is with just basic woodsmanship like mm-hmm. i like even before i knew anything else how i killed bucks when i was just the biggest dumbass ever was i would go into a thicket with my rifle and i would just sneak through face in the wind Mm-hmm. And just understanding that one concept, like if you go in, you know, with the right wind, then you could shoot a doe easily with a rifle. Like, right. You'll see a white tail. She'll stop and look at you. You smoke her. And I, and I learned that, like, mm-hmm. okay, face to wind. And then you can, like you said, you can expand on that. And so over the years, um, I, I felt like by focusing on basic woodsmanship, like food, and sign and um and wind and just some of the basic stuff that i think we forget about Mm -hmm. um that has enabled me to go out and harvest a bunch of deer even if it's just does Mm -hmm. or you know 120 inch bucks whatever um and even the bigger bucks that i've killed i feel like i wouldn't have killed them if if i didn't have the basics together so for whitetail 101 um it started out as just my personal page um Mm -hmm. i had like a bunch of deer pictures up and everybody was like i think i had 72 followers so one day um i was reorganizing everything and i kind of redid my whole page and i just started posting like here this is a picture this is greenbrier and it got like freaking 80 likes and i was like (laughs) like Okay, so then I was like, this is Greenbrier and this is Catbrier. And it got like 200 likes. So I was like, that's clearly what people want to see. And that's what I love is like how to frost seed versus using equipment. Because I do no-till because I'm, I'm a lone wolf. Like I don't have yeah. equipment or anything. But I, so, so that's how I got started. Um, my page ultimately grew because people were, would, would message me like asking me about like... Um, you know, uh, what I thought about the acorn crop and things like that. And maybe what I might do in a situation. And so what I ultimately did was change the page to, to whitetail 101 because, um, I found myself talking about basic stuff a lot. And it, I guess through all of this, I didn't know about it, but I guess through all of this, I realized that I like to, I really like to focus on the basics because I think that's, that's what pays off. Yeah, it's man. not your saddle and it's not your mm-hmm. rifle or your Leopold scope, man. It's it's, it's none the, of it's, that. Like it's the fundamental stuff, man. <clears throat> and that's what I've been talking a lot about is like the yeah. foundational things, like no matter what you do, hunting or anything else. Yeah. If you're really, really good at the fundamentals, like then if you need to pull a rabbit out of your hat, then you then you can at some points, right? Because you just have a lot of fundamental skills that makes you have you know makes you capable of doing more complicated things or with with more ease or with more efficiency but getting the fundamentals right like the people who are successful at anything they're always really really good at the fun- you have fundamentals to be, you have to because no matter what kind of data collection you do and we didn't really get it all at this time uh with historical data um i'm i'm the most ocd about historical data and what i will call historical data just because a big buck passes my camera i don't call historical data um for example i'll just throw a a, a a thought out there but for example i don't use scent on any of my mock mm-hmm. scrapes because i want to catch deer moving and doing, doing deer natural things. deer yeah. things 
Yeah. I personally feel like if I spray buck fever on that vine and that deer crosses a cornfield to come check it out, that is not historical data. That's, That's a not bad what he data does. point. Yeah. That's not what he normally does. And if yeah. you're going to write that in a book and hunt that, you are going to be a sad guy. Like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. So awesome. a data point isn't, a, you know, they're not all created equal. It has to yeah. be a natural deer data point, not one that buck fever pulled in or anything else right. like that. So, so right. for me, um, uh, uh, well, I guess my point was that no matter if you have a, a buck that's coming all the time at a set time, if you don't know how to hunt there because you don't know how to get in there, or if you don't know how to sit in a tree downwind, uh, or understand access, you're never going to kill the deer. I, yeah. you know, I can't count the times I had a buck showing up, showing up, showing up, and I could not kill him because I couldn't get in there. So woodsmanship, yeah. or or you you finally find him and he disappears because you didn't realize the nuts dried up. Or yeah, yeah. Um, so just knowing the ba- just knowing some of the basic stuff, the man. Yeah, exactly. It's, just yeah, knowing- it's what kills the animal. Your your hard work finds him, um, but woodsmanship is what kills him, and then. Moreover, though, for me, the biggest ingredient I would say to doing like few sits is once you find an animal and you have some basic woods, woodsmanship skills and you find an animal, um, the next most important thing for me is verifying my access. I want that back to the two or three season thing. I want that to be an animal that's on a camera that I have proven time and time again that I can service that camera. I get in, I get out, and guess what? He shows up tomorrow, and he's not phased by me. Right. If I can, if I can find the animal, and I have some basic woodsmanship skills, and I've proven that I can get in there time and yeah. time again, like year over, and it doesn't bother him. Well, that, I mean, that, yeah, he's in trouble, that, man. At that point, you are uh, <laughs> you're in the chips. But uh, cool, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, buddy. I got to jump. I got to take. I got to actually. Drop my wife up to the car dealership to pick up her car so she doesn't have to take my truck again tomorrow. You know how we are about, yep. you know, someone yep. else driving my truck. So, <laughs> but I appreciate oh, you coming yeah. on, brother. We'll have to do it again and talk more long term data. Sound good? Likewise. Yes, sir. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there too. And before I shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Osseo Gear, Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Genesee Beer. And until next time, we'll see y'all.